we are. Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Pen Nottinghamshire Pension Fund Committee on this first day of autumn, I believe. Um, may I just say that um, it's a bit of a sad occasion. I'd rather say something now than later about Councillor Eddie Cubley, who sadly passed a couple of weeks ago. Um, Eddie was a member of this committee, a very valued member of this committee. I knew him personally uh, and through a number of years through politics and other things locally. Um, many people would not have realized that um, Eddie uh, was a quiet man, but actually he, was, he also did some amazing things. Um, I won't tell you about those. Hopefully we'll have some more words to say at the next county council meeting later this month. But if you want to just spend a few seconds thinking about him, um, um, and we'll, then we'll move on to the meeting. Thank you. Okay, my name's Eric Kerry. I'm the chairman of the uh, meeting, and we've got members, officers uh, around uh, the room. Um, I'll remind members that the meeting is being broadcast live um, on the internet, um, and so would you please use your microphones when speaking so that you can be heard on the broadcast and by remote attendees. Before we begin the meeting, um, just like to remind members of the public that we do have um, <coughs> rules and regs that placards, banners, advertising materials, and similar items not permitted in any committee meeting must be covered or removed. Failure to comply may result in member of the public being asked to leave the meeting. Members of the public should remain seated during any debate and not do anything to endanger the health and safety of any person. Members of the public may record proceedings and report or public meetings. Any person recording the meeting must not disrupt the good order of the meeting. Mobile phones and other devices must be switched to silent. That's obviously for members and officers too. So moving on to the first uh, item on the agenda, the minutes of the last meeting. May I ask uh, if the, any members have any comments or any uh, corrections on the minutes? And uh, if not, can I ask if the committee uh, can agree that the minutes are approved? Okay. I see no dissension, so I will sign those later. Item number two, uh, apologies for absence. Um, Joe, uh, Officer Joe Toomey, can you um, confirm apologies and substitutions, please? Thank you. We have um, to start with Councillor Butler here today, who will be substituting for the vacancy created following the death of Councillor Cubley. Um, we've also received apologies from Councillor Francis Purdue Horan and Councillor Stephen Garner from Nottinghamshire County Council, Councillors Graham Chapman and Zafran Khan from Nottingham City Council. Councillor Gordon Moore from Rushcliffe Borough Council, Sue Reader, who's the scheduled bodies representative, and Alan Woodward, who is one of the trade union representatives. Thank you, Joe. Are members officers aware of any other apologies? I can't see any indications. Okay, thank you very much. Item number three is declarations of interest by members and officers. Do any members or officers present have any disclosable pecuniary interest to declare? I don't see any. Do any members or officers present have any private interests, either pecuniary or non-pecuniary, to declare? Again, I don't see any. Okay, moving on to item number four. Um, I have pleasure in um, welcoming Councillor Sally Longford uh, to the meeting, and um, we are asked to note the appointment of uh, Councillor Longford as one of Nottingham City Council's representatives on the committee. And before we do so, May I, may I just say um, that uh, Councillor Longford is, is, is replacing Councillor Anne Peach um, from the City Council. And I, I would just like to ask you, Sally, if you could pass on our thanks and regards to Anne over the number of years she was on this committee. She was a very valued member, often asked very good questions and, you know, her scrutiny was excellent. So please just pass on our thanks for her work. Thank you, I will do. Thank you very much. So I'd just like to ask members um, to note the appointment of Council Longford. Any comments, questions? No. Thank you very much. Moving on to item number five, Local Pensions Board Annual Report. It's on page nine of the agenda pack. So 
so we were hoping that uh, the chair of the board, um, Tulani Malife, would be here today. Um, I've met with him a number of times now, and he, he was expecting to be here, but he's had to uh, apologise, sadly, because he's been called away unexpectedly for work, uh, with his work. So before I open the discussion, I'd like to move the recommendation on page 10 of the agenda pack. Ask for a seconder, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. I'll second that. Was my thank you speak. very much. Um, so just to say that whilst Delaney isn't here today, I'm sure the members of the office in the room who have been at meetings with him can help with any questions that um, you, they may need to ask. So any, you, you've, the report is quite, um, what's the word, detailed. Uh, it's quite interesting. I have attended. I was at that, at that meeting where their report was presented and approved. So do any members have any questions or comments, please? Councillor Introner, Mike. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, just in regard to some of the comments relating to staffing and staffing levels, I think it's fair to say that uh, as a council we've already uh, responded proactively and, and positively to some of the increased demands and certainly in regard to recruitment uh, within uh, the uh, pensions team led by Sarah and, 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 and John and the team. And also that, that that's raise some questions just in terms of looking at organisational integrity and so it, uh, across other functions are starting to look in, in a, a not dissimilar regard. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Any other questions or comments, please? No. Okay. Well, I'm very happy to uh, find that the members, are, 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 I believe, will support the recommendations. So I'll a uh, ask members to... Uh, Vote by show of hands. All those four, please. I don't see that's that's unanimous for the people here, so there's no need to ask for those against or any abstentions. Okay, that's carried. Thank you very very much. Item number six is the Pensions and Lifetime Saving Association Conference 2022. Um, before I hand over to uh, Mr. Stevenson and Nigel to present the report, I'll move the recommendations on page 24. Yeah, I'll second that, second Mr Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Nigel, would you like to take us through your report, please? Thank you, Chairman. Um, hopefully, members found the report quite informative in terms of the what was a very good conference. It was attended by a lot of people, and it was good to get back to actually being in an in-person conference. Um, it sets out some of the work of the Scheme Advisory Board and covers quite a lot of the areas that the committee has been looking at and discussing over the last year or more. So, and that was going to leave it at that. Thank you, Chair. Yes, thank you for the comprehensive report. Um, it was a, I, I was there. It was a very intensive uh, conference and, and lots of really good questions. Um, I, I think it's, it's well worth uh, the time spent there. And should any members, please, if you wish to, to go along to the next year's, please let us know sooner than later so we can make the, the, the arrangements. So I'll... I'll uh, Ask if there are any comments or questions from members, please. I don't see any. Okay. Well, the recommendation has been moved, so uh, all in favour, please. Thank you. And again, that's unanimous for people here. Uh, I, will, I will still ask any against or abstentions, and there are none. Thank you. Item number eight uh, is the working party. Sorry, sorry item, number, item number seven is the, the other, the other um, forum. Before uh, I hand over to Tamsin to produce her, her report, I'd like to move the recommendations on page 29 of the agenda pack. Local Authority Pension Fund Strategic Investment Forum. Tamsin. I'm sorry, Tamsin, I nearly missed you out. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. The 2022 Local Authority Pension Fund Strategic Investment Forum was held on the 4th to the 6th of July 2022. The conference was attended by Councillor Eric Kerry and Councillor Graham Chapman, along with myself. Details of the main oh. sessions are set out in the report. The conference was excellent with an intense programme of investment topics. The presentation by Chris Atkinson of Fidelity International, who are one of the investment managers in our LGPS Central Global Bonds Fund, was of particular interest. The presentation looked at the role that bond investors play in influencing organisations to decarbonise and the importance of directing capital to companies taking these issues seriously to help enable real-world 
emissions reduction. Uh, Fidelity has very kindly provided us with a recent paper they have written on the importance of bond investors in the fight against climate change called The Sleeping Giant. And um, there are copies for members to take away at the end of the meeting, if they would like them here. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Tamsin. Uh, it was remiss of me not to ask for a seconder for the recommendation at the start. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Does actually report, say ask for a seconder twice on that, yeah, uh, yeah. those notes, and I'm certainly not going to interrupt a lady. So thanks for the report, Tamsin. I second that. Thank motion. you very Thank much. You. Okay. Um, it was again. Uh, it was a good conference. I wasn't expecting to go, but circumstances meant that there was a, a, an available place, and I jumped at the chance to do it. I hope people on the uh, internet can't see me sighing about that decision. But, I, you know, it was, seriously, it was a really, really good conference. And there were a lot of the investment managers there had a lot of really good stuff to talk about, not just at the conference, but also um, at the dinner and, and the other uh, breaks during the, the, the meeting. And that informal thing added, actually, I think, a lot to the, a lot to the discussion. OK. Um, any questions or comments from members, please? Yes. Councillor Longford. Sally. Thank you. Um, Thanks for the report. Uh, given that the County Council declared a climate emergency in 2021 and the website uh, says that it has an ambition to become carbon neutral in all our activities by 2030, I wonder if any consideration has been given to creating a green bond as other councils such as Islington, Eastbourne and Lewis, Cotswolds, Blanagh, Gwent are doing in order to build more renewables uh, locally and invest in renewables in the local community, as recommended on page two of this paper. Um, as item 22 states, we're heading for catastrophic change in climate. We can see the evidence all around us with record-breaking temperatures here in Nottinghamshire in July, devastating floods in Pakistan and Sudan, rapid and irreversible welting of the Greenland ice sheet. And I've read all the reports about engagement which I know this committee favours, but as it states in item 22, it can be difficult to measure the outcomes of this activity. And we're not in a position where we can take chances with our future. So I wonder what actions, um, radical actions, the, uh, the pension fund is going to take in order to ensure that there's a ramping up of investment in renewables in the near future. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Councillor Langford. Um, what, what, I would, what I would say to you, first to your first question, uh, we're here to, uh, where our responsibility is for the Nottinghamshire County Council Pension Fund, and we have our own um, strategies uh, in terms of all financial risk. Um, the, the, the County Council has its, uh, its own policies separate from, from here, so we can ask to pursue that uh, at another place. Um, in, in terms of all risks, including climate risk, an ESG responsible investment covers a lot more than, than climate. They're all important. Um, we have been proactive over the years, and I'm sure that as you um, come to more of our working groups, our meetings, you'll understand the proactive work we've done in terms of responding to, to financial risk of climate change. Um, and helping us to understand how we can pay uh, the future pensions of our members, which is the most important thing that we, that we do here. Um, it, uh, Tamsin, do you want to, 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 to add to that in terms of the, the questions asked by Councillor Longford in, 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 in the, from the investment perspective? I think the other thing to say, I apologise before I, I, let, I bring you in, is that we, we have uh, diversified our investments and we have infra infrastructure in investments and, and in green investments, so we already have that. And if you would like some information about those, we can get that to you. Tamsin. Yes, that was pretty much the, the thing I was going to add, was that there are Sorry. details about our yeah. um, investments in renewable and sustainable investments in the, um, in the investment report, um, and you will see that those yeah. are ramping up. Okay. I'm sure, I'm sure you could be able to ask more questions um, later. Thank you. Any other questions or comments, please? Councillor Camilleri. Yeah. Can you use your microphone, please? Uh, thank you, Chair. I, asked, I read the part about green bonds, and I'm very interested in them, obviously, because they, they look very good. But what, the, what is a green bond 
made up of. I know it's in renewals, there's all talk about things, but what actually physically it, it goes within a green bond? Perhaps we might be able to explain that to me more. Because uh, a lot of talk about it, but what does it mean? Do we, is it wind farms? Is it, is it, what is it? Tamsin, do you want to come? Oh, oh Tamsin, so sorry. Will, will, Tamsin, no, sorry. perhaps, I don't know. Sorry, will, sorry. William, would you like to come in on that, please? Is, can we swap a microphone out? Oh, yeah. oh, no, okay. No. No. Yeah, William, William. Um, Councillor Cavallari, you were looking at me the whole time. I, 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 to be honest, I'm not an expert in green bonds, but in principle, they're like an ordinary bond, yeah. but they're kind of rather like impact investments. Yeah. They're targeted at investing in, in, in activities which will actually make a difference to the environment. So it's almost like an impact investment. You're not looking just for the financial return. It's a kind of looking for a bit more than that. Um, and I, yeah, it's a... Does that answer your question, Andre? No, not really. I mean, I'd like to know what... Uh, I think it was Islington you said. It was Islington one of them. I mean, what, did the bond, what is the bond made up of? I mean, if it's localised... I understand the, the, the advantage of having a local green bond and local thing, but I'm interested in what goes in it, you know. Is it the wind farm? Is it the... Is it, I don't know what goes in it. I'm not, I'm not being... I hope I'm not being a bit vague there, but I, but I really would like to know. Okay, look, I, we, we have regular training. I'm sure we've had green bond training in the past, and so I'm, I'm sure we can reintroduce that at one of our training sessions, and or in, indeed we could talk to some of our investment managers on, on bonds, our, our guilt's investor, about that LG, LGPS Central. So we're able to do that else, elsewhere. Lee, Councillor Waters, you have a question. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, for once, I was going to actually echo your comments, but um, yeah. It's on pension fundamentals too, I think, where they talk about green bonds yeah. and impact yeah. investing. Some of it is putting money into the, the local community, sponsoring green initiatives. It can be sustainable investing, such as wind farms, etc. But um, really, local impact as well is a big, big part of it. But um, yeah, if we could have extra training on that for committee, it'd be great. Yeah. Thank you. Yep, I agree with that. Okay, Tamsin. Um, if I may, I'd just like to thank Councillor Waters for demonstrating how important that fundamentals yes. training course is. Yeah. And I would strongly recommend that all members of the committee that have not yet attended, please contact me so I can register you for a place this autumn. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Tamsin. That's a very pragmatic response. Thank you. Okay, well, I don't see any, other, any indications to speak. Um, we've moved and seconded the recommendation. So, can I have a vote for all in favour, please? Show with your hands, thank you. Any against or abstentions? None, that is carried, thank you. Item number eight is working party that we had. Um, before I move over to Tamsin report, I move the recommendation on, I think, page 32 of the agenda pack. Thank you, and I would love to second that, please, and thank reserve you. my right to speak. Being proactive, Councillor Introner. Okay. Tamsin, would you like to take us through the report, please? Thank you, Chair. Members are aware of the Working Party in July to discuss the use of derivatives in the Shoulders Active Equity Portfolio and the LGPS Central Gilt Segregated Mandate. This meeting gave members the opportunity to question Shoulders and LGPS Central, who both presented on the subject, on the advantages and associated risks of using derivatives on this mandate, and as a result of this, a report proposing the use of derivatives has been written for this meeting. Training on voting principles and strategies was provided by LGPS Central. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Tamsin. Before I move on, I just want to make a correction on page 35, the attendance. Um, I, it, it's not clear. Most of the ones in attendance have got black squares with, in attendance in writing in it. I'm sure that Councillor Tom Smith was here. It says apologies have been cross through. Just for confirmation, councillors Tom Smith was in attendance. Okay, so um, I'll open that up to questions or comments from members, please. Any questions or comments? It was a very, very, very good working party, very informative. 
Councillor Clark. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Just to say it was the first one I'd attended, yeah. and I found it. I thought this is going to be like watching paint dry, but it, I eventually got there. Uh, I thought it was very, very useful yeah. and helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Clark. Councillor Waters, you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, again, apologies why I couldn't attend that um, particular working group. It is one I wanted to attend. Um, could consideration be given if we have a meeting on a Thursday and then a working group is on a Friday, could the two not be on the same day to benefit people who actually work and do other items as well throughout the week? Um, funnily enough, I work for a firm of chartered financial advisors and we also had a discussion on derivatives, but I would have liked to have heard it as well from Schroeder's and, and your particular angle. So if that could be borne in mind and also working groups, as they're not a formal committee meeting as such, they can actually be done by hybrid meeting, if that could also be an option considering the money county councillors put into hybrid working. Thank you, Chairman. OK, thanks for your comments, Councillor Waters. We'll, we'll take a look at that, but organising meetings is always very difficult. There's always somebody that can't make it, and it's very, very difficult. I don't want to create any preferences for certain individuals or members over others that can't make it, so it's best that the officers do that separately and independently. I think that's the best way. Thank you. Any other questions or comments, please? No? Okay, so we've moved the recommendation. 32. I'd ask all those in favour, please. Any abstentions or any against? I don't think there are any. So that is carried. Thank you. Okay, so again, moving on to item number nine, the derivatives use in Schroders, Active Equities and LGPS Central Gilts mandates. This is the outcome from uh, the working group. And um, again, I think given the depth of uh, discussion that we had and the opportunities that, that this creates for our investment managers to enable better performance, um, uh, with the tools, the tools that they've got from the, our mandate with them, this is, I think this is a very, uh, very, very positive um, thing. I will, I will move the recommendation on page 39 of the agenda pack. I'll second that. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll okay, second that. Thank you very much. And hand over to Tamsin, um, and also to Olivia Docker, who's here with us today from Schroders. Thank you. Who gave us as part of that excellent work on, on the day. So welcome. Welcome today. If, any, if we need to ask, answer any questions, yeah. I'm sure you're happy to do so. Okay, Tamsin, report, please. Thank you, Chair. As recorded in the investment strategy statement, the pension fund is permitted to invest in a wide range of assets and strategies, which includes using derivatives. However, the fund will not invest directly in derivatives, including currency options, without the prior approval of the pension fund committee, which is sought in this report. Both Schroders and LGPS Central believe it would be beneficial to the, import, to the performance, cost and efficiency of the mandates if such derivative use was permitted. For both mandates, use would be for the purpose of efficient portfolio management only and within the limitations set out in the report. Members were able to, to question Schroders and LGPS Central on the advantages and associated risks of using derivatives on this mandate, these mandates at the recent working party. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Tamsin. And, and just to, to confirm that, it's a t uh, the highest, we can't um, invest more than 1% in equity index futures as part of those, that investment mandate, if that thinks correct. 1% of that mandate. Minus plus or minus three. Oh, there's an, sorry, there's an example on page 38 where it shows, yes. Yeah, and so the view there is that actually the position sizes that we'd be taking would be limited to really plus or minus 2%, but the reason for the 3% allows a small element of, of drift to that 2% trade right. that we right. might have implemented before we have to correct it. So right. it's, it's really at the margin, but it is where we think that we can add value at that margin, um, taking a view around the geographic positioning of the benchmark, tilting the portfolio just a little bit to the markets that we think are going to outperform and holding a little bit less in those that we think are going to underperform um, to help meet the scheme's performance objectives. 
Thank you, Olivia. I'll open it up to questions and comments from members, please. Lee, Council Waters. Is the, is your microphone is the microphone? I'm not sure. Sorry, hopefully you, you heard. Hopefully you heard most. Well, I can of that. hear, but the members out the, the public can't. So do you want to just go through that again, please? Yeah, that that's fine. Um, it's a bit of a query on um, derivatives. I understand the concept. There is um, no actual requirement for the fund to, to use mm -hmm. derivatives. I get it for its use of hedging and managing currency risk, adding diversification, etc., where it could improve performance, fair enough. But counter to that, I think it is adding in another layer of risk, of speculation, and particularly counterparty risk during this time of financial, well, I wouldn't say financial crisis, but volatility. I get that derivatives can hedge against some volatility, but for the purpose of the pension fund, I'm actually minded to vote against this personally. I'm quite sure other people in the room will try and convince me otherwise. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, so Olivia, can you respond to that, please? Because it, 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 yes, it is about risk, but without the use of derivatives, actually, you're not mitigating some of that risk. Is that yeah, that's a, correct. Um, in terms of the the investment objectives of um, the County Council's mandate with Schroeder's... Oh, sorry, uh, microphone again. I'll have it closer to me here. Um, in terms of this scheme's um, equity portfolio that's managed by Schroeder's, um, within the terms of that mandate, it mentions that the um, performance... We seek to meet the performance objectives through stock selection, which is what the underlying teams do, but also through asset allocation. And, and that is, uh, around 80% is, is uh, estimated to be generated of, of excess returns, estimated to be generated by stock selection, 20% by asset allocation. Now, that asset allocation piece is actually very difficult to implement if we're selling the whole underlying portfolios and not very efficient to do. Uh, it's expensive. And so what happens is that the multi-asset team tend not to trade those underlying portfolios because the benefits of that is sort of largely outweighed by the costs of implementation and also the timing of implementation. So allowing the use of derivatives would it, is really just enabling us to fulfill the mandate as it's written and to generate additional returns that we see um, through the um, tactical opportunities um, that the multi-asset team identify. In terms of risk management, it's a valid question, hence the the position sizes are limited, and there are also, as, as written in the report, um, restrictions on the use of leverage, i.e. we're not going to be increasing um, the overall size of the mandates that's invested through derivatives, which is one way in which they can be used, but that's specifically excluded through this. Um, and the other point you mentioned on counterparty risk is, again, a valid point to raise. Um, and I can only reassure you that all the counterparties that we would be used um, within the Nottinghamshire portfolio would be those that are approved by Schroeder's counterparty risk management team. We have a team uh, that is dedicated to looking at the financial stability of the counterparties with which we trade um, and excluding those uh, with which we're not comfortable. Um, and so that's done on an ongoing basis um, to ensure that, there is, that we're not um, exposed to counterparties where there is that concern. Thank you, Olivia. Councillor Waters, you happy with that response? Well, anyway, yeah, okay. Are there any other questions or comments from members? William. If, if I can just kind of comment, just add to that. Um, your, there is an additional element of counterparty risk, but I think it is very, very small indeed from my experience, as, um, as, as Olivia has said. I would just point out that on the, particularly for the LGPS central on the gilt side, there's a great deal more liquidity in gilt derivatives than there is in the actual physical market. And it, you know, really you're tying one of Gordon's hands behind his back if you don't let him do that. Yeah. Um, it actually, in the equities as well, it is part of kind of modern portfolio management for most managers will be, have the ability to use derivatives. 
And again, I think we wouldn't be tying a whole hand of Schroeder's behind their back. You might be tying up a finger if you, um, if you didn't let them do this. Um, yeah, and just one point. The comment was made about speculation. This is absolutely not about speculation. Mm. That's quite clear from what, what both LGPS yeah. Central and Schroeder's have said. It is about both hedging and a limited amount of efficient portfolio management to try and add value by asset allocation. So I certainly would support what has been yeah. suggested. And, and, and I'm sure, recall, that we, we did talk about all those elements of risk, et cetera, in, in the working group before we came up with a consensus of the meeting to put this recommendation forward today. Okay, are there any other questions or comments? No, so um, we'll now move to the vote on the recommendation. So show your hands, please, if you're in favor. Any against? One against and no abstentions. That's carried, thank you. Item number 10 is the independent advisors report. So, <coughs> so I will welcome and introduce those who have not met William before. He's our independent advisor and uh, is at our meetings and working groups all the time and conferences as well sometimes. So uh, would you like to take us, uh, I'm going to move the recommendation. There isn't a recommendation actually. So there were no, uh, I think it's a noting report, but William, can you take us through your report please? Okay, thank you very much, Chair. I, normally what I do here is spend about three or four minutes just kind of going through what's happened to markets and any implications I can see for the fund going forward. Um, today I'm going to start off with inflation because inflation is both the biggest risk to the fund uh, and secondly, what is really driving market movements at the moment. Um, if you believed what bond market pricing is saying, you would think that inflation is going to come down quite sharply. I'm there forecasting inflation in America of around 2.7% in five years' time, so a really sharp fall from where we are today. But I think anybody looking at what's happening around the world, and often you know, bond markets are not always right in what they're projecting, anybody looking at the world will say there's clearly risks on the upside. And it's coming both from food and energy and what's happening in the Ukraine, but also I think from the, kind of the fact that labour is going to get a larger part of the pie than it has historically. You know, unions are, you know, not, maybe not wrongly, asking for higher wages, but going forward, we're going to see labour taking a larger part of the profits made by companies. And that, again, is going to be inflationary in terms of wage inflation. Um, what are the authorities doing about it? Well, they're talking a tough talk. They're talking about raising rates further, but actually, although they were very, the Fed was very, very aggressive in tightening policy the first half of this year, um, it's actually taken its foot off the pedal a little bit and it's been a little bit less aggressive. So I think they're also seeing the risk of a recession coming up. And if you look at my page, my art, uh, paragraph seven, I put a little table there of the IMF's kind of economic forecasts for the next couple of years. And the points I would make are, first of all, that global growth is kind of falling, is forecast to fall below 3%. But really, more importantly, an awful lot of that is down to China. And if China disappoints, growth is going to be a lot lower. And secondly, I'm afraid the UK, yet again, is right at the back of the pack. And that, I regret to say, kind of just reflects the kind of poor level of management at a whole range of levels in the UK. Um, turning to markets, first half of this year was the second worst six-month period, so the second worst first half of a year ever for the US market. It was really, uh, coming from sky-high valuations in January. It fell you know, more sharply than it's done. It's only once fallen more than that. Last three months, I think markets have slightly been calling the authorities bluff. They've been saying, OK, if there's going to be a recession, maybe you aren't going to raise rates as much as you say you are, and that's why markets have risen. But actually, I think the Fed is going back and saying, well, actually, we are going to raise rates. And that's the kind of real pivot at the moment as to whether rates go up, markets go down or not. Putting all this together, we can see that consumers are going to have a really hard time. That's you know, clear as, but the one really clear thing. You can see that inflation is going to remain high for some time and could be higher than people expect. And we can see that growth is going to be very low. And to me, that all adds to a lower equity market. Um, and I, the only reason I could be wrong is if the Fed does suddenly change course and start to either lower rates or find a kind of signal that it's about to lower rates. 
Closer to home, just looking quickly at the UK, um, I don't know what the new Prime Minister, whoever it is, is going to do, but it looks horribly like they're going to basically reach for that magic money tree and just use financial easing to try and solve the country's problems. And sadly, it may solve them in the short term, it isn't going to in the long term. It all adds up to pretty low returns going forward. And we are a reasonably well-diversified fund. We've spent time putting money into assets other than equities. But I think we can expect equity markets to go down, bond markets, not quite so sure that the pricing will go down, but they, it could well do. Um, and I think we just have to kind of brace ourselves for a period of kind of returns of 1%, 2% over the next year or two. Um, as I've said before, we have a strategic asset allocation review coming up at the next working party, um, and I will be looking at these matters. I don't actually expect to change the asset allocation very much, but we should certainly be kicking the tyres. And one of the questions in my head is, should we, putting, should we be putting more money into bonds now that yields have become higher? That's not saying I'm going to suggest we will, but I think we ought to ask that question. Sorry, I've spoken for a bit longer than usual, but there's, as ever, quite a lot going on at the moment. No, thank you, William. I think it's very important that, uh, that you, we looked at your report in, in, in detail. But I think one of the most significant comments is at, at the end of it, really, where you said that currently our asset allocation is, is pretty good in terms of the, uh, averting any of that risk out there. Then our, our diversification has done that as much as we can at this point in time. But obviously that may change in some ways in, in the coming future as there's more clarity of, what, of what's happening out there. Okay. Um, any questions or comments from members, please? No, I don't see any. Okay. Well, I, I will just move, I add the recommendation to move that we know. Sorry, John Clark. Yes. Councillor Clark. Thanks, Chair. I'm just, I, I know I'm only new, <coughs> excuse me, new to this committee, but it, what, what's the flagging up system for this? Because things are moving rapidly, aren't they? Uh, you know, the, the, the new Prime Minister, whoever the, that person might be, We'll come in and say we're going to do this, that, and the other. I've got one sign telling me we've got one point, God knows how many trillion uh, we, we already owe. Um, and, and we've got a hell of a lot of people in this pension fund that are relying on the management of it and everything else. So how, how does the sort of traffic light system come up to ordinary members like this and say we've got some serious problems in another year, 18 months' time, or whatever? You've already mentioned the bonds, which we, we could be quite useful if they were used properly. But I'm, I'm, I'm a little, well, just a bit more information, really, on yeah, that. Adult. The, the committee takes advice from officers yeah. and our advisor, and we have regular um, meetings annually to look at our asset allocation, sometimes actually interim ones as well. We're, it's being looked at every day. We're not just waiting yeah. from meeting to meeting to, to do that work. It's happening on an ongoing basis. Should something happen that is significant enough for us to make a change of decision or whatever, we, we will do that. William, do you want to respond to that, please? Thank you. But we're, we're, in it, we're in this for long term, we're not in, it, we're not in for short term speculation. Now, again, for the benefit, benefit of the newer members, the other really important party here is the actuarial advisor, yeah. because he or she is the person, actually he in our case, is the person who kind of sets what, what kind of target mm. return we need to make to make sure the pensioners yeah. are paid. Not, you can never guarantee in investment markets what's going to happen, but to make sure there's a pretty good chance that we can pay pensions on time and in full. And actually, that process, there's a, once every three years, they do evaluation of the fund, and they kind of crunch through their numbers. And they give a um, presentation here, which can be a little, a little heavy. Um, and they, yeah, they will, that, that's the point when they kind of, you get the chance to really question them, are our pensioners going to get paid or not? The, I mean, as the chair said, we are a very long-term pension fund, so don't expect huge changes, even in response to quite major market movements. You know, we're looking 40, 50, 60, 70 years out, so any movement tends to be pretty gradual, and that's why I kind of make the point that though I, although I do think that the future, i.e. the investment market over the next 20, 30 years, is going to be very different from the last 20 or 30 years, I'm not actually projecting a huge change to our um, actuarial valuation. But the actuarial advisor, you'll hear more about that over the next six months and what he's saying, because we had our valuation in March. And that's the one to really kind of ask the questions. That's when to ask the questions. Thank you for that clarification, William. So um, we've heard the report. I'd just like to move that we note the report. Ask for a seconder, please. Yep, second that, Mr. Yeah, Chairman. And uh, ask people to support that. Any, all those in favour of noting the report, please? Thank you. 
That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Item number 11 on uh, the report is the work programme. Um, the recommendation is on page 43. Um, we're going to consider any amendments need making to that. Um, I'll formally move the recommendation. Yeah, I'll formally second, second that, please. Thank Mr. you, Councillor Introner. And uh, hand over to Samzin for report, please. Thank you, Chair. In the appendix, you can see the work programme for the rest of the committee meetings of the current cycle. Um, I had a brief conversation with John <coughs> before the committee meeting, and we were talking about reviewing the pension fund strategies, which we usually yeah. do in the autumn yeah. once a year, and I've noticed it's not on the, yeah. in the work programme, so we need to add that to the November okay. meeting, please. Um, and the committee is asked to identify any additional reports required. Thank okay. you, Chair. Thank you, Tamsin, and we noted that. That, um, that addition. Um, any other comments or questions about the work programme, members, officers? Chair. Yes, Mr. Clues. Yeah, John. sorry, Chair. Just one other thing. I am currently drafting a report uh, to be placed yet in relation to uh, cyber security. Okay. Um, and um, I'm not quite sure where I'm going to be able to finish it as at this time because I need some further information. But uh, I will be placing a report at some point, maybe November or December. But okay. I'll keep Joe informed of that. Is that on the to be placed one? Should um, we put it in there for the moment? It is, yes. But well, I just wanted to update because it's been there for a, a little while. Okay. Uh, but uh, yeah. I, I thought I'd seen it, so yeah. we've not placed it yet. Okay. No. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions, comments, please? No, okay, so I'd like to uh, ask people to, sh to show by a vote of hands whether a four. And that's unanimous, thank you. None against, no abstentions. Item number 12 is fund valuation and performance. Again, uh, <coughs> it's uh, recommendations on page 57 of the report. Okay, um, I'd like to move that recommendation as for a seconder. Second that, please, Mr Chairman, reserve my right to speak. Thank you, Councillor Introner. So well, let's, I think I'll now hand over to Tamsin to present the report, please. Thank you, Chair. This report is to inform the Nottinghamshire Pension Fund Committee of the value of the pension fund at the end of the latest quarter and provide information on the performance of the fund. The table in paragraph three shows the valuation at the end of June, at the end of March, and the value a year ago. The fund investments have decreased by 294.9 million, which is 4.5% since the previous quarter, as inflationary fears and central bank activities impacted confidence. Within this valuation is 421 million of infrastructure investments, amounting to 6.7% of the fund. 9.7% of the fund is now committed to infrastructure investments, largely due to further commitments made to LGPS Central's new infrastructure fund. Paragraph 6 shows a more detailed analysis of valuations by portfolio, and paragraph 8 should show the first quarter figures for 22-23 and the unaudited fund account for last year. However, since putting together the report, um, I realised that a formula in the spreadsheet I copied this from was corrupted, and the profit on disposal of investments and changes in value for last year is correct. My apologies. Um, the correct figure um, is published, in fact, all the correct figures are published on the County Council website alongside the Council draft accounts, um, and I would refer members to those. Paragraphs 9 to 20 relate to the fund's holdings in fossil fuel fossil fuel companies and investments in sustainable equities and renewable energy. There are a number of caveats that need to be understood in interpreting this disclosure which are explained in the report and I refer members to these. Over time it is anticipated that fossil fuels will decrease as a proportion of the fund and that investments in sustainable e equity and renewable energy will increase but this long-term trend will not be smooth. At the end of March, we had an estimated investment of 188 million in fossil fuel companies, which is 2.9% of the fund, and sustainable and renewable energy investments amounting to 748 million, or 11.4% of the fund. Members are reminded that a more thorough um, 
assessment of our exposure to fossil fuels through our equity investments is provided by LGPS Central's Carbon Risk Analysis, which assesses the carbon intensity and weight of fossil fuel and coal reserves, as reported to the meeting in November. The core index portfolio section reflects the equity market movements over the last quarter. The Shodas portfolio shows the regional analysis of holdings and purchases and sales during the period, including a transition of around 320 million into the LGPS Central Global Sustainable Equity Fund. The LGPS Central portfolio also shows a 30 million pound transfer from gilts to corporate bonds and a further 20 million investment in the emerging market fund, as well as capital calls on the infrastructure fund. Aberdeen have continued to manage our property portfolio with two sales during the period. The specialist portfolio section shows the composition and valuation of the specialist portfolio and the transactions during the quarter. There was a new investment in the Aegon Sustainable Diversified Growth Fund. The section on responsible investment activity summarises some of the responsible investment activity which has taken place during the quarter on behalf of the fund. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Tamsin, for the very detailed report. I'll open it up to members. Councillor Waters Lee. Um, thank you, Chair. I've got a couple of questions actually. Um, relating to page 51 of 72 or page 3 of the report, um, as Tamsin mentioned, we've had nearly a circa 5% decrease in the net asset value of the pension scheme. Um, some analysts are predicting inflation could be 18% or more this year. This pension fund is essentially backed by taxpayers and there is some inflation linking which is paid out to the members. Do we foresee a council tax increase to cover any of the pension fund deficits? William, yeah, this is about actuary. I, I can't give a straight answer. I'm not, you know, no. that, but what I would say is that that will depend, of course, on what the actuary, actuary. how the actuary levies, yeah. levies contributions. Um, and yeah. Yeah, there's a bit of a kind of payoff here between if, and it is it's a discussion. He doesn't just say what they are. We have a you know, discussion between him and officers as to what they should be. There's a bit of a payoff, a trade-off between if you have higher contributions you kind of get more stability because there's a less chance of having to increase them in the future. Um, and you can also take a little less risk on the investment side, so therefore there's less chance of things going down badly. If you go for lower contributions, then you have to expect a little bit more of the return to come from investments, which means taking more risk. And therefore there's a slightly higher chance that in the future you might have to raise contributions by more. I mean, I, I can't predict what discussions between officers and the actual will be, but I suspect that there will be a fairly strong um, view that contributions should not go up if possible. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to speculate on, on the outcome of that, but I think the other thing to say about it is that, that our current fund valuation uh, is significantly higher than it was a number of years ago. Uh, and we became very close to almost 100% funding for our future liabilities. I'm not sure where that is now, because obviously times have changed and we need to understand what our future liabilities are. So we're in a strong position, I believe, as a fund. Um, Nigel, did you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, I was, I was just going to echo what, what you've said, Chairman, and, and what William has said, in terms of it will be down to the discussions we have with the um, e actuary, but also, as, as William has mentioned earlier, in terms of it's a long-term investment, so it depends on... What, we, what the actuary believes for the discussion with officers and with William's assistants in terms of what we think that return will be on the current asset allocation and whether that needs to be reviewed as a consequence of that. But you also have to remember in terms of that um, there was, in the past, there was a, trying to keep the contributions from local authorities some stability to it, but it changed the last valuation to be it's about protecting the pension fund and pensioners. And in this committee, unfortunately, that, that's the discussion that we should be having, which is about how to make sure that the fund is, is stable, yeah. albeit we have to recognise what the impact is to the taxpayer. But you also have to remember that the government also reviews and takes an interest in terms of what that 
looks like, and that may, and I'm not going to speculate, but it will potentially change or could change what the scheme looks like if it gets above a certain cap level, which is what, where's where government steps in. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions? Did Lee, sorry, you have another question? Yeah, if, if I may, unless you want to give someone else a turn and I'll come back in or I'll, I'll go now. No, please. Yeah, no, okay. No, no. Um, again, on the same page, um, it's on the face of it, it looks really positive to see the increase in sustainable investments uh, back in June 21, circa 4%, then 7%, and now just over 11%. So that, that's looking really good on the face of it. If it was up to me, which it isn't, I would have that exclusion policy where we wouldn't be investing in fossil fuels whatsoever. I can see the allocation has been quite bumpy and choppy on that, and we're still quite high in that at almost 3% of the allocation. Um, part of, of this on the sustainable and renewable investments is obviously due to stock picking and, of course, the sustainable fund. Some of it is going to be due to um, passive indexes we're invested in. So naturally, you can see utilities and energy stocks are increasing, tech stocks are decreasing, so it's going to impact some of that allocation anyway. A caution, though, it's quite difficult to, to analyse exactly what is fossil fuels and is renewables. A lot of companies, as per the report stated, are actually interlinked and not necessarily separated out. So there's an opportunity there to, to play with statistics. Um, I'm, it's also interesting to note that there has been a recent change in what counts as sustainable and renewable. You may have seen what's recently happened in the EU Parliament and Joe Biden in the, in the USA, where in financial services, both um, toxic waste producing nuclear energy and also carbon emitting natural gas has been reclassified as both sustainable and renewables. So in time, that could impact our figure of sustainable and renewables and potential for even more greenwashing in that particular figure. So it'd be interesting for me to have a breakdown of what actually is in that sustainable and renewable. For example, is it hydro energy? Are we talking about solar, onshore, offshore wind? Or are we talking about renewables, which are biofuel, um, which is palm oil, which has led to deforestation? Are we going to be talking about nuclear energy? Are we talking about natural gas? So it'd be nice to have further transparency on that figure in due course. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Waters, for your um, question, well, comments and questions. I think, I think it's very complicated. We do have a process with LGPS Central. We look at climate risk analysis and other responsible investment things that we do. I, I just would throw a little bit of caution to one of your comments. Was, it may have hinted that you're accusing the, the officers of playing with statistics. Uh, that's not the case. Our officers are very diligent in... in, in, in you said play with statistics. You said play with statistics. OK, all right. Well, thank, thank, you, for thank you for that clarification. OK, 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 OK. Well, anyway. Irrespective of, of, of what you just said, I'm, I'm sure that our officers use the best available information and metrics to provide us with the, the data that we need to make decisions about our responsible investment policies. Tamsin, do you want to add to, to comment on that, please? Uh, thank you. Yes, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. It's a very difficult thing to yeah. summarise in a way that can be done on a quarterly basis, and this is an attempt to provide the committee with some additional information on that quarterly basis, and it does come with a whole load of caveats. What I would say is that 
we have been quite prudent with our assumptions. So mm. the whole of BP, for example, yes. which you quoted, is down as a fossil fuel investment, yeah. even though it has renewable aspects. And anything where the majority of the company is classified as an energy company, that is down as a fossil fuel company, even though a chunk of it, in fact, even the biggest chunk of it could be renewable energy. We, we don't distinguish for this purpose. Um, and when you talk about the underlying investments, we don't necessarily have all of that detail, certainly not in a regularly reportable way, because it's based on the on the funds we invest in. So if we have a fund which says 20% of this fund is in renewable energy, I'll take 20% of the valuation and that's what gets reported in these figures. If you want to know exactly what's within that fund's holdings, that involves a lot more detailed research and I don't have a way of pulling that information together, I'm afraid. Okay, yes, Councillor Longford, Sally. Thank you, Chair. Um, um, a really interesting report and value the, um, the data that's provided and, and echo what Council Waters says about the concerns about classification and that sort of thing. Um, and I'm interested in the fact that it says that it's anticipated to increase the sustainable equities and the renewables um, and decrease the fossil fuels as a proportion over time. Um, however, I believe that the trajectory needs to continue to increase and I really think that we need a target date for, for divestment from all fossil fuel investment um, because it, it's inevitable um, that climate change will, will increase the urgency of this. Um, recently in July there was a report to the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea which said that um, it may be failing in its fiduciary duties to younger members because of the long-term risk of fossil fuel investments. And we're talking here about, as, as has been said, long-term investment. And fossil fuels are going to be toxic. Um, going forward, there will be a, 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 a move away from and a lack of investment in those, uh, those areas. So I believe the majority of members of the pension fund including the, the Nottingham City Pension Fund members, would expect the scheme to act responsibly and play its part in urgent action to combat the threat of climate crisis. Um, there is no profit in a dead planet, as has been said many times. So we need, to, we need to make provision for the future and to move away from fossil fuels more rapidly and set a target date, I believe, for complete divestment. Thank you. Okay, we, we have, you may, may well be aware with your contacts that have been members of this committee, still members of this committee and before, that we have spent, we have been proactive in understanding climate risk uh, in terms of our pension fund investments. We will continue to be proactive, but our, our philosophy is about responsible investment, which also has the benefit of encouraging fossil fuel companies to transition into a, into a green energy and that is actually happening and we can show in in reports where companies have um have moved more of their uh, future investments into green green energy um and I, I i don't think we can add to that right now we get regular reports regular meetings regular working groups about the climate impact of our investments and we'll continue to do so do you wish to add to that, Tamsin or William, maybe? I don't know. A very quick comment. I don't think any of us disagree about the objective of how we get there. But when you're talking about companies like Shell and BP, they may be in your bad books today, but actually they are also quite big investors in the whole area of renewables and renewables infrastructure. And they can see the light just as much as you can. They are moving in that direction. And our best role here is to try and push them to move as yeah. fast as possible. Thank you. Andre, and then uh, John. Andre, microphone. Um, things are changing rapidly out there. Uh, there is a there is a problem with energy all over the world. Um, we uh, we've got people who are going to be suffering no energy in winter. There is talk now about fracking. Uh, North Sea 
uh, gas exploration uh, coming back on board. Um, I'm not, I'm not saying whether that's responsible or not, but that's what it looks like it's going to be happening. And we not only have a responsibility to the, to, to what that we have a responsibility to our pensioners who are getting older, who may be suffering from, um, you know, they may be not be able to afford the, the heating bills, and we've got to make sure that they, they get their heating, their lighting, and we've got to support these companies, whether it's sustainable or not, in creating, so we're safe, so this country is safe, as its own energy needs looked after. This is the problem. We've gone very quickly and we're short of energy now and I'm just a bit worried about the future. I'm not saying that we shouldn't do what you say, but uh, there's going to be a lot of people suffering this winter because of the rush for this um, zero, zero, for the rush forward and it's, and it's affecting everybody, affecting the war as it is. That's, what, that's my opinion. Okay, um, I don't really want to get into a debate about no. climate change. This is not what we're here to do. We're here to look after the future pensions right. of our pensioners in Nottinghamshire. And as some are a little bit beyond now because they move away. So we have a system and process where we look at this and we understand the detail, as much detail as we can to understand the long-term, long-term uh, implications to our our members. So I don't really want to get into that. We will have other discussions in other meetings about that. Um, Councillor Clark, John. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Chair. It's just really uh, supporting Sally in that. I think we do need to name some date. It'll be difficult to, to be quite firm with it, but some, some direction. I think you're doing well, actually, on the looking at those figures that Lee mentioned. You know, we're, we're up to 11.37%. Uh, I think that, that that's important. So also, I did talk to the chief executive yesterday. I said, this is like a Christmas tree, this place. is a former electrician. I know how much was being burnt in them lights. They're on every day, all day, and we've got to educate ourselves, which will have to come out in full council, so try and do some policy there. I was just going to ask, uh, Chair, whether the... Uh, have we got any investment in the new wind farms? If you notice, uh, is it the Grimsby one this week, which has come on online? That's got 1.3 million homes off that one which apparently is the world's largest uh, wind farm. I don't know the company that's doing it, but there's the, there's the other one which comes on next year, which has got six point uh, something million homes it can, it can uh, uh, supply power to. Do we have any investment in, in any of those firms that do that? Because it seems to be, you know, being in Ireland, it seems to be the right way to go. Thank you. Tamsin, um, I mean, we, we have our investments through different investment managers. We have passive investments which can which includes a, a great spread of, of global investments we also have our active managers we're going to be speaking to them uh, later today and we can ask those questions in terms of those specific investments i think it would be wrong for me to say we should be invested in that or not that's an investment management decision not for something for us to we, we can question it so we should be in it but it's about the long-term returns not just the, the, the yeah it's part of that discussion sorry tamsin please Yes, I'd, I'd have to go away and do a bit of research to find yeah. out if we, if one of our investment funds is yeah. actually investing precisely in that particular yeah. Um, yeah. Um, set of, of offshore wind. But we, the pension fund does own quite a few yeah. funds that are invested in offshore wind along yeah. that coast. And I think I had a, um, a communication from one of them about um, wind turbines off Hornsea, which is just a bit further up the coast. So, yeah. yeah. But it's about, the, about these investments need also to provide the returns we need to pay our pensioners in the future for decades and decades. Of, yes. Yeah. 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 Thank you, John. Uh, any other questions or comments, please? Okay. I don't see any. So we've moved the recommendation. And I'd like to ask for a vote by show of hands. All those four, please. Any against? There's one against and any abstentions, none. It's carried. Thank you. Okay, we now move on to item number 13, which is the exclusion of uh, the public. We now move to the part of the agenda that proposes we meet in closed session to consider the exempt information in relation to agenda item 14, 
I therefore invite the committee to resolve that the public be excluded for the remainder of the meeting on the grounds that the discussions are likely to involve the disclosure of exempt information as described in Schedule 12A of the Local Government Act 1972 and the public interest in maintaining the exemption outweighs the public interest in disclosing the information. Okay. I now ask to ask for a seconder for that, please. I second that formally, please, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I'd like to take a vote by show of hands, please. All those for the exclusion. That, again, is unanimous. Thank you very much. So I need to pause and wait for members of the public to leave and for the, the live uh, screening to be switched off. Thank you.